try to go to, well, I'll prepare myself at home first, you know, so I make sure that I'm like ready to go. I'm not living with any kind of like personal turmoil going on in my life or anything like that. So I'll make sure that I'm feeling nice and clear in my consciousness and like my intentions are well, because I feel like if I'm going to go into a place where there's ampli an amplified response to those subconscious intentions and fears or problems, then I don't want to go into an amplified place if I'm experiencing a lot of depression or negativity, if I'm not feeling good about what I'm doing and what's going on or why I'm there or whatever. So I prepare myself that way, first of all, and make sure everything feels right. I feel good. And I kind of feel like I really want to go to this particular spot. I'm feeling really curious, almost like passionate about it or inspired to go there. And then when I get there, I continue to follow my intuition, almost like I'm listening to my inner compass a little bit about where to go. And I'll go find like the known petroglyphs or ancient dwelling sites that are there in the area. And then I try to follow my intuition beyond that. And a lot of times that leads to me sitting down in a particular spot, overlooking a view, and then I'll start to meditate. And then from there, it depends on how much like preparation I've done leading up to it. A lot of times I'll just start meditating. And that starts with like trying to just visualize the past or visualize like what was going on here. And I don't try to overlay any kind of assumptions I almost go into a mindset like you would uh, if you're doing remote viewing. If anybody's familiar with remote viewing, there's an, an opening of your aperture that has to occur. And if you have uh, assumptions that are jumping in there, they call that analytical overlay to where like a flash might come into your mind, like an image of um, like a, a waterfall or something like that. And in your mind, you think, oh, there must be a waterfall somewhere nearby. And so you jump to all these conclusions that might not necessarily be true. So you have to just stay open-minded and clear to kind of like non-physical impressions or uh, little visualizations or uh, epiphanies that come to mind and stuff while I'm sitting there. And a lot of times that leads to me sort of in a flow state where I'm hiking around or walking along and then I'll make a discovery where I'll find like a whole nother set of petroglyphs I didn't know or something interesting or arrowheads or ancient pottery, different stuff. And so I follow that along and sometimes I'll sit in a spot and get meditating. Next thing I know, the sun's gone down. There's been like four hours of missing time. I'm freezing. I didn't even realize, or I'm like sweating to death and didn't realize. And I'll have like a whole kind of a visionary experience that's very Native American themed or something. And then I come home and try to piece it together and read books and study online to make sense of what just happened and what I saw. And then I go back and keep exploring it. And sometimes I'll get really sick. I'll go into a slot canyon and do the same thing. And by the time I'm, I've hiked back to my truck, I'm like throwing up and nauseous and very dizzy. And then I have to do a bunch of cleansing work to try and get myself back on track. Sometimes it takes like two, three days, <laughs> but it's just going with experience. Um, I'll, I'll do everything from like, uh, like play audio music and Native American stuff out over a speaker. I don't want to try and do it myself because I, I didn't, I wasn't raised in the culture to be able to try and mimic it or copy it. So I'll play music or sound through a speaker to try and connect with the environment. Um, I will, um, I'll take a uh, sound bowls and do my own like Buddhist meditation sound bath in the area, uh, a lot of different stuff. So it just kind of depends. And then I'll also bring out, you know, scientific e equipment. If things start to occur, then I try to capture it on night vision with a tri-filled meter, a rim pod, or with uh, other type of gear. I even have a radiation uh, detector. So then I try to narrow down and see if I can actually pinpoint it on a physical repeatable something that I could show like a, a doctor or a skeptic or something like that, that I could actually capture data off of and try to match it to. And that's where it gets really interesting is when you actually start to capture things. Can, can you talk um, the, the tools that you're using? So tell people that are from scratch, like 
I don't, the middle one, I didn't recognize what you were saying. So tell them, tell them about that. We're going to also talk about dimensions after that, but talk about what you think you're getting and what you're measuring and, and maybe mention some of the names of the gear too, because we're, we'd like to know. Yeah, it's kind of this theory of a narrow bandwidth of the, of what reality actually is. We only see so many colors of the rainbow. We can only hear so far into the audible spectrum, but really all of reality from the vis visual to audio, even to the physical senses are all a frequency or a bandwidth. And so we try to use equipment in order to see beyond or hear beyond or sense beyond our physical limitations, try to peer into the blind spots or listen into the shadows or whatever. And so the equipment that I have is everything from night vision equipment, like full spectrum night vision cameras that will film and record to audio uh, recorders and equipment. I have spirit boxes, you know, the ones that will loop through FM or AM radio stations, and we'll, you can try to interact through different frequencies that way. Um, the REM pod is basically a, a temperature anomaly sensing device. You put in a, lift the antenna up, and if a, a sudden shift in temperature or something approaches it from one direction or other, it will light up and make a noise. So you can actually ask questions and interact with things sometimes like touch touch that antenna three times for no and once for yes or whatever and you can sometimes ask questions and get interactions um i have a tri-field meter and that's like a sensor that detects electromagnetic fields and uh, radio frequencies and magnetic fields it's kind of finicky um, and then i also have a radiation sensor that's just straight up uh, detects radiation levels um, as you're walking through an area. So if you hit like a uranium deposit or some kind of anomalous radiation, or if you're seeing a UFO and wanna know if it's safe to walk up to whatever, uh, I have all of that as well. And then, uh, you know, I have friends that have expanded equipment to everything from dousing rods all the way up to ground penetrating radar and drones. and thermal gear, uh, all kinds of stuff. So yeah, everything from military grade equipment all the way down to just pseudoscience, paranormal ghost hunting equipment and you name it. I even have goggles that are those dicyanin goggles that they make where you're supposed to put them on and it makes you see a certain filtered light spectrum to where you can see shadow figures and stuff. I haven't really seen anything too interesting off of it other than little like light energies moving around, but other than that, not too much, but yeah, it's, it's just cool to get a lot of different varieties. So you can, if you get, find something interesting or an interesting location, then you have a, a lot of different ways to check it. 